Uh, Christoph is a very influential figure in the field of brain computer interfacing. He is the founder and CEO of GTEC, a company that provides uh, EEG and ECOG devices and various other brain computer interfaces uh, for uh, research, consumer, and uh, medical fields. Uh, he received his PhD from the Technical University of Graz in 1999 and has since uh, done wonderful things in the field of BCI. I hope you will uh, well, um, join me in welcoming him to uh, Microsoft Research. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you now hear me well? Yes. Okay, so welcome to my talk about BCI new technology. So I'm coming from GTEC, and GTEC is located actually in Schiedelberg. This is where I'm sitting at the moment. So we have about 1,000 people living here. So it's a very nice place to work. And then we have also an office in Graz. This is actually where we are doing the hardware developments. And we are also in Albany, New York, in Barcelona, where we work together with a couple of universities. And we are also in Vancouver, Hong Kong, and in Sapporo. At the moment, we are running about 15 different research projects. They are mostly from the European Union and they are all dealing with brain computer interface projects. So one example is recovery flag. In this case, we use brain computer interface technology for stroke rehabilitation to produce better gait. Or in BMagic, we are working together with ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And they are producing nanoparticles and the plan is to insert these nanoparticles into deep structures of the brain, for example, the thalamus. And with magnetic poles around the head, we are able to activate the nanoparticles to provide a very localized electrical stimulation. And this can be used to uh, treat, for example, tremor. And on this slide, you can see an application from Dragan Illich. He hooked an industrial robot up to a brain computer interface, and then he fixed many different colors. And during the Ars Electronica Festival, people could stop by. They got calibrated with the brain computer interface and then could they could contribute a little bit to the painting. So this was lasting for five days. And afterwards, Dragon was able to sell the painting in London for a lot of money. And in this publication, you can actually see a comparison of different uh, companies who are using brain computer interface technology. And you can nicely see that Cheek Tech is actually leading the field with 54 different medical applications that you can realize with our products. And that's also the reason why we have many happy customers, for example, Airbus or BMW, are using it for uh, aviation. And then, of course, we have a lot of universities, Stanford, Harvard in the US, and of course, also Microsoft, which is very nice. So for running brain-computer interface experiments, you need, of course, a subject or a patient. And we are able to register the EEG on the surface of the skull. But we can also do invasive ECOG recordings when we work with a neurosurgeon. Then these ECOG grids are implanted directly on the cortex. And then the brain-computer interface gives us a control signal for external devices. And very important is this feedback loop. So we have to feel or we have to see what we are controlling in order to get better. But data quality is essential. This is something that was done uh, with our Gene Oculus device, which is on Chiara here. And this is a publication from Germany. They did a 16 minutes EEG recording uh, experiment where the participants hands played computer games or they performed some cognitive tasks. And then we just looked on the artifacts in the data. And you can see our Genotilus device with Ladybird electrodes. These are active electrodes, performs just much better than all the others. This is very important, especially when you are working with patients or with end users. So you don't want to lose any second of data. It has to work all the time perfectly. And there are other devices where you lose more than 50% of the data. It is, of course, just unacceptable. And one of these devices, the Unicorn Hybrid Black, that we are using. So uh, there's a switch where you can just switch it on. Now we have eight hybrid electrodes shown here. So they have little pins, eight pins. They are seven millimeters long. And this is just long enough to go through the hair layer and to penetrate the skin. And 
diesel knows us to use it in a dry fashion without electro chill. This is nice for a couple of applications like cognitive tasks, but for some experiments, people are moving more, and then you get the option to insert electro chill through the hole here. And then you can do a wet recording, which is much more stable. And with this hybrid electrode, you can nicely choose what you actually want to do. And here I'm showing you an example from Martin Walshofer, one of our computer scientists, when he's using the Unicorn Hybrid Black. On the right hand side, you can see all eight electrodes are green. This means we have nice data quality. This is actually the backyard of our company. And Martin is going to do a backflip. And you can see one moment later, the EEG data is clean again. So even when he's walking, the raw EEG data is nice. And this is what we mean with clean and robust EEG recordings. And these uh, brain computer interfaces are also used in our Brainio Designers Hackathon. So this is a worldwide event that we are already organizing for a couple of years. The last one was, for example, at IEEE SMC in Prague. And we had participants from many different countries, uh, more than 300 people in the hackathon, more than 40 teams. And we work also with hosting partners. So these hosts are having mostly the unicorn education kit. This means eight pieces of the frame computer interface. And then they can host locally students, artists, programmers, neurologists, neurosurgeons, whoever want to participate in the hackathon. And you can see that we had, for example, hosts from Tilburg in the Netherlands or Alport University in Denmark. But people can, of course, also come to our headquarter in Austria. It is very nice because they can just test all our different BCI systems, uh, including EEG and functional near infrared spectroscopy, all the stimulators. So it's a very nice way to get in touch with technology. And here's an example of one of the hackathon teams. This was actually a team from Otto Bock, and they designed this prosthetic hand that you can see here during the hackathon. So they went to the electronic shop, bought some electric motors, uh, 3D printed the housing, and then they programmed the brain computer interface. And this was all done within 24 hours. So a very nice result. And this is also a funny project, a gin tonic robot. So in this case, the team was measuring the EEG data to figure out if the person is stressed. And when the person was stressed, then the robot mixed more gin into the cocktail. And if the robot, uh, the person was less or more relaxed, he got more tonic. And for research applications, we have, of course, also devices that have uh, up to 64 channels. And here you can see these active electrodes uh, surrounding the whole skull. The little box on the back is actually the biosignal amplifier, the 24 bit analog to digital conversion and we use uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, digital transmission. And important is that the system is very lightweight. This means when you're moving your head, then nothing is pulling on the electrodes, so we don't get these micro movements. And for that reason, we get ultra clean EEG data, which is very important for nice experiments. And on top of that, Johannes Grünwald, one of our PhD students, developed OSCAR. Uh, this is an online cleaning algorithm for raw data. So on top, you can see eight channels of raw EEG, and on the bottom, you can see the OSCAR process data. So Johannes is going to make a couple of artifacts, like clenching teeth. You can see it's completely killed. Now he is shaking the head. After OSCAR, it's clean again. Now he's bending the head. Muscle artifacts on top, completely cleaned out. Now he is quickly shaking the head, and Oscar gives us very clean data. And this is, of course, very important for many applications because with this module you can even do home recordings, or you can also easily do recordings with coma patients. They are moving uh, suddenly, and this is producing a lot of artifacts. Um, we have also a unit which allows, for example, to combine EEG and FNIS recordings. So you can do functional near infrared spectroscopy at the same time like EEG. This allows us to have the very fast EEG analysis and the slower FNIS signal. And this can be used to boost brain computer interface classification accuracy or just to find different biomarkers, which are either coding in the EEG or in the FNIS. 
So finger movements, single finger movements are very nicely coded in EEG and pain, for example, is nicely coded in FMOS. And with that, you can just combine it. Then we are reading the data into our GTEC suite 2020, which is consisting of GHISUS, GBS Analyze, Need Access and Recorder. And here you can see how the software interacts. So we are reading from one of our biosignal amplifiers the data in real time into GTEC suite with GNEED access. And then you get real time access with the MATLAB Python C or .NET application programming interface. And this allows you to set up your own experiment. At the same time, we are sending the data to G recorder to visualize data, to calculate in real time ERPs or heart rate and to save the data in MATLAB or HDF5 format. And afterwards, you can do the offline analysis with GBS Analyze. And here we have a huge library with many, many hundreds of functions for EEG, ECG, ECOG, EMG, and so on. But at the same time, we can also send the data into g with Professional. So this is our rapid prototyping environment. And whatever exists in terms of brain-computer interfacing and was developed in the last 25 years is inside the toolbox. This allows you to build up a new experiment in only a few hours. Then you can save the data, you can calibrate the brain computer interface, and it's ready for real time experiments. And here you can actually see Gerd Pritchler, who was my supervisor during my PhD, and he described the event related desynchronization or ERD first. And basically, it means if a person imagines a left hand movement, then contralateral the right hand, right hemisphere is activated. And the red spot here is actually the amplitude attenuation in the alpha region. And if the person imagines right hand movement, then we find the activation of the left hemisphere. And these spots are on the same location for every human being. And for that reason, we need, we, we know exactly where we should place EEG electrodes for capturing left and right hand movement. This is something that we are using nowadays in a medical product called Recoverix for stroke uh, treatment. So here you can find a stroke patient equipped with the uh, Nautilus device. Here's the biosignal amplifier. We are using active electrodes. And in the in front of the patient, we have a unity avatar. And in this case, the avatar is lifting the left hand. And this is the instruction for the patient to imagine the same type of hand movement. Then the brain computer interface picks it up and we trigger a functional electrical stimulation of the left hand so that the hand is really moving. This is something that patients like a lot, especially if they were paralyzed for a couple of years. Here you can see one of our patients who is actually doing the rehabilitation procedure. So now he's in match now the left hand movement. The CI system picks it up and then we stimulate for about four seconds the left hand to get a nice dorsiflexion. So this is by the way, the healthy hand of the patient and the right hand is the paretic hand. Um, which was affected by the stroke. So he imagines the right hand movement. The stimulator is activated. You can also see in the index finger that there is still some spasticity because of the stroke. And this procedure uh, is randomized and we do 240 hand movement imaginations in one evaluation session. And people have to come back for 25 sessions. And afterwards we get highly significant improvements. And here's one example of a lady who had a stroke when she was 38 years old. And she came into the recovery treatment 14 months after the stroke. At this time, she was at home. She couldn't work anymore as a hairdresser. So the social security system was paying her salary. And this was actually the life expectation for the rest of her life. And in this diagram here, you can see she did in total 31 training sessions. In the beginning, she reached 65% accuracy, and with every single session, she got a little bit better. In session 26, she even reached 100% accuracy. This is exactly what we want to achieve. And if we look at this diagram here, then we find the red vertical line. This is actually the time point when she gets the instruction to imagine left and right. You can see it takes the sensory motor cortex about four seconds to get activated, and then we find a difference between left and right. And in session 31, you can see the sensory motor cortex is activated within 200 milliseconds, so it's much faster. 
because the difference between left and right is much bigger. And this is exactly the brain plasticity that we want to produce. And if we look at the event-related desynchronization maps, then we have here the left hemisphere, here is the right hemisphere, this is the alpha and the beta region. And the healthy hemisphere, for example, shows some red activation, which is good. And the paretic hemisphere has a lot of white color. This means the left hemisphere is not activated because it was damaged by the stroke. And in session 31, you can see a lot of red color, even on the paretic side. And this is the brain plasticity. So the neurons form new connections, and we get a much higher activation of the sensory motor cortex. And this is tested with 18 different functional tests. So one of these tests is the upper extremity fugel meyer assessment. And you can see here the patient increased very nicely between the pre and post testing. But very interesting is this nine hole pack test. So in this case, the patient has to put nine little packs into certain positions. And we are just measuring the time for the left hand and for the right hand. So even the healthy hand improves by 16%. But very interesting is, of course, the improvement of the right hand. At the beginning, she needed more than seven minutes to complete the test. At the end, she could do it in one minute and 14 seconds. That's an improvement of 600%. And very interesting is also how quick it was. In the third session, she could do it in three minutes, 21 seconds. In the fifth se uh, session, already in one minute, 34 seconds. So this means less than four hours of training, and the fine motoric skills were already coming back. And in this video, you can actually see how the nine-hole pack test looks after the recovery treatment. You can see the test is pretty difficult, so you have to get these packs. Then you have to lift it, you have to rotate the hand, you have to put it into the hole. So for somebody who had a paralyzed hand, really difficult. And this is the speed that somebody has with one minute and 15 seconds. And on the right hand side, you can actually see the first haircut that she was giving to our physiotherapist after the treatment. Watch at the right hand, that's the paretic hand. And afterwards, she was able to open her hairdressing institute again. And yeah, I have some slides from Kai Miller, who is a neurosurgeon at Mayo Clinic. And he implanted here some eco grids. And then he asked the patient to be at rest and also to do a hand movement. And he calculated the power spectrum. And here in the low frequency band, you can see that we have more energy doing resting than doing hand movement. This is the event related desynchronization, which is represented by a very large cortical network. This is also what we are using for recoveries. But in the high frequency band between 80 and 100 hertz, it's exactly the opposite. So during resting, we have less energy into than doing hand movement. And there's only one single electrode responsible for the activity. And this is something that we can also use to decode single finger movements. So in this case, the epilepsy patient had a data class, moved a couple of times the thumb. And you can see in purple how we can decode from the dark blue electrode the position. And very interesting, for example, is this first movement. So it's a new task for the uh, cortex, and we get a large overshot of high gamma activity. And with every single repetition, it gets smaller and smaller. This means it must be a new task for the cortex to get activated. And very nice is here that we can also do it for the index finger and also for the little finger. This is something that's almost impossible with EEG data, but the ECOG has this very high spatial resolution. This is something that we are using in Cortec U. This is a medical product which allows us very quickly to identify important cortical regions. And this epilepsy patient, for example, has electrode grids implanted. And there's actually a cable coming out of the scalp. And we are instructing him with a computer screen what he should do. So at the moment, he's just relaxing. Now he's sticking out in and out the tongue. And first of all, we get an activation of the temporal base. So this is the face sensitive region. And a few moments later, we find an activation of the sensory motor region responsible for the tongue. Then we ask him again for 15 seconds to relax, not to do anything. And then he's listening to a Japanese story that we are reading via the loudspeaker. So 
So first of all, again, we get an activation of the shape sensitive region on the temporal base. And a few seconds later, you can see that the auditory cortex and Wernicke's area is activated because he's hearing and also understanding the Japanese text. And he's relaxing again so that we get additional baseline activity. The last task is to solve Rubik's cube with his fingers. But first of all, he sees the colors and the shape. So this activates this shape region and the color region, the temporal base. And afterwards, we find the finger region located here. This is important information for the neurosurgeon because if he removes the brain tissue below here, then the patient cannot move the fingers anymore. And this, of course, is something that you want to avoid. In this case, Dr. Ogawa is showing different images to the epilepsy patient. He's just observing, and the brain computer interface is analyzing if this is a face or a symbol. So that's a symbol, a face, another symbol. Very nice is that we can even detect it faster than the patient is realizing it. Very nice is also that it works with real faces. So now the patient sees himself as a face. This is Christoph Cabello from our company. This is also interesting. He's already used to Dr. Ogawa's face. And that's the reason why we don't get immediately the high gamma activation because it's not a new task for him. And if we want to achieve a lot of Decrease of freedom, then we can also use the P300 response. So in this case, I can instruct you, for example, to look at the P and to count as quick as possible how many times it's appearing. And then we randomly show all the other characters. And as soon as the P appears, now we find the P300 response overlaid to a standard visual evoke potential. And of course, we want to make the experiment as difficult as possible to get a larger P300 response. And Manny Donchin came up with this 36 character spelling matrix. And when you are waiting for the W, then your brain responds with the green line. So you can see the amplitude is about seven microvolts and the latency is about 220 milliseconds, so around 300 milliseconds. And for ABC, you get the orange response here. And of course, we want to spell as quick as possible. So a very easy trick is to highlight the whole row and column at the same time. And I'm showing you now a video which is actually 15 years old, uh, but I want to demonstrate how technology improved. So this is actually a very good BCI user. We have eight electrodes over the most important positions for registering P300. So the vertex is normally the most important one. And then we are using MATLAB and Simulink in this case for calibrating the brain computer interface. And we use five characters like shoes to set up the calibration signal. And then the person just has to look at the different characters and count as quick as possible how many times it's flashing. You can also do it like one, two, three. So this gives us 45 seconds for the S with 30 repetitions of the P300. Then we can already move to the next character, which is the age. So altogether, we need about four minutes for calibrating the P300 speller. But doing the calibration, it's important that you're not speaking, you should not move, you shouldn't have a chewing gum, so that we get very clean EEG data. And afterwards, we can already spell much faster. Um, so here you can see the calibration phase. I'm trying not to move at all. I'm not speaking. And then we are reducing the number of flashes to only two. And I'm going to spell in a few moments the word GTAC. And you, uh, so here's the first character, one, two, selection done. Here's the T, one, two, selection done. This is 800 milliseconds, already comparable to two fingers on the computer keyboard. And here's the C, the last one selection done. And this is somehow the upper limit of a P300 speller, but of course you can combine it with a predictive speller. And very nicely is also the trick. So if you overlay it with famous faces, then this is producing a really big P300 response, and it's easier for the brain computer interface to detect it. And with this setup, we reach 100% accuracy just for everybody. And here you can see what we are doing nowadays. Uh, this is a video from Bernard, 
one of our computer scientists. He's using the Unicorn Hybrid Black in this case and Unity. So we are doing the whole data acquisition and signal processing in Unity. He's selecting the serial number of the device. On the top right, you can actually see green colors now. This means all eight EEG electrodes are good. And then he can already start the calibration. It takes 20 seconds. So he's just looking in the middle of the screen. And after 20 seconds, it's completed. And he's now showing 30 items on the computer screen. And he's just selecting one after the other. So at the moment, he's on the top left. Now he's looking here. And the red little circle indicates the selection of the brain computer interface. Now he looks here. Selected. Now he looks here. Selected here. Selected here. And so on. So you see it takes only a few moments to select one of the items. We don't get false positives. So if he if he's not looking at one of these rectangles at all, there is no selection. And also the speed of selection is very nice. Show you the last one. He looks here. And also this one is successfully selected. So it works with very high robustness and speed. And the P300 response is also something that we are using for the Blondie check. So this is our politically incorrect name for the software package. In this case, we are showing for 100 milliseconds different images to a user. And the brain computer interface makes a ranking of the most important images for your brain. So I start the video that you get an impression how this works. So the user is just looking. And in the background, the BGI system analyzes the data and you can see the blonde girl ranked on first position. Then we have some other human beings. The least important picture is, for example, the landscape for this user. This is, of course, a funny application, but you can also do neuromarketing uh, studies of logos, for example, or you can also use it for crime scenes to investigate it. So it has also serious applications. Beside that, we can also use the brain-computer interface or the P300 response for patients with disorders of consciousness. So if we look at this diagram, we have normal people with normal motor responses and normal cognitive functions. But some patients in coma don't move and they don't have cognitive functions, so the EEG is completely flat. But some patients are a little bit better. The vegetative state or minimal consciousness state, they don't move but they might have some cognitive functions. Same is the case for locked-in patients or completely locked-in patients, but it's just very difficult to figure it out. And that's the reason why we developed the brain-computer interface mind Beagle, so to test command following in these patients. So here you can see the recording situation. These patients are lying in a bed, equipped with the brain-computer interface. The physician or the nurse can run the experiment. And the first experiment is always an auditory booked experiment. So we put in in earphones and then we play high and low tones and we instruct the patient, please count only the high tones. And this gives us this nice green P300 response if the patient is able to do it. And the blue response is for the low tone. Whatever is green shaded, shaded is statistically significant. And in this case, it's very clear to see that the patient was able to do it. But in reality, these evoked potentials are very often really ugly and nobody knows how to interpret it. And that's the reason why we need again the brain-computer interface classification accuracy plotted here. So in total, we are giving 30 high tones and this patient needed only four high tones to reach 100% classification accuracy. And this means we can perfectly discriminate EEG data from high tones versus low tones. This means the patient was able to do the task. If the accuracy is 0%, then we know the opposite. The brain is not able to process this information. And after that, we can go one step ahead. and We can ask questions to the coma patients. And in this video, a therapist is asking in Italian language, am I speaking in Italian? And the expected answer is actually yes. So I start the video. 
So she was now asking, am I speaking in Italian language in Italian? The expected answer is yes. So we have little uh, viproductal stimulators on the left and on the right hand. And if the patient wants to say yes, then she is counting the little vibrations on the left hand. And if she wants to say no, then she is counting the little vibrations on the right hand. It takes about 30 seconds. It is the magic moment if the loop moves at all because this confirms command following and awareness. And this is exactly what, what we want to figure out. Now you can see in a few moments that the loop moves to the yes. And this confirms actually the correct answer. And of course, you can also ask exactly the opposite. Am I speaking in English, but she's speaking in Italian? Expected answer is no. So the therapist is again giving the question, and then she's pressing the button here. The brain computer interface is requiring 30 seconds of EEG data, and then the loop should move to the no. And actually, after one minute, we have answered these two questions, and we get a very objective proof that the patient has command following. And this is a life changer for the patients because suddenly the family comes more often, the physicians are motivated to do something. So a very nice and quick test to understand if these patients are able to do something. This confirms again the answer. And now I'm coming to the last principle that I would like to explain today, steady state visually evoke potentials. So if a person is looking at the seven Hertz flickering LED, then we find also a peak at seven Hertz in the power spectrum, also at 14 and 21 Hertz. And if we want to have two degrees of freedom, then we can just have two LEDs, for example, 17 and 14 Hertz to move a cursor left and right. This is something that we tested in a tele telepresence experiment. So we had a little robot on the floor and video cameras above transferred to a computer monitor and the patient was supposed to move the robot along the path. These icons were moving forward, backward, left and right, and we just measured accuracy. And on top here, you could see the first experiment. So this is a standard stimulation pattern for SSVPs. For example, we switch on and off the fields with 10 hertz. This works for most of the people, but not for everybody. And that's the reason why we are using the code-based stimulation illustrated here. So we are switching on and off for a certain time. This represents a certain code. And then you are able to find the same code in the EG with template matching algorithms. And with this setup, we reached current average accuracy of 98.18%. So even perfect accuracy for everybody. And even when you're using a joystick, you're not able to reach 100%. That's the reason why we hooked it up to World of Warcraft. So I can show you the video. So here we have in the middle of the screen, uh, World of Warcraft, we have four icons for moving forward, left, right, and for doing certain actions. So he, he can explore the environment, he can look around. The little chicken is helping him to do certain tasks. Very nice is also that you can play against each other. And you can also attack one of the enemies and destroy it, for example. And in this video, you can see the setup, this head-mounted display. So in this case, we have the G Nautilus device under the HMD, and we implemented an augmented reality setup. When he's looking at the different markers, then you can he can actually switch on the light bulbs very accurately and very quick. So it's also a very nice uh, environment. And in this case, we have a little maze with control att controls attached. And there's a red ball, and we are nice moving the ball now to the left side. You can see we get a very continuous movement. There are no mistakes. Now he's moving the ball upwards to the left-hand side again. And down, so we need for the transition about one or two seconds. 
but there are no false positives, there are no mistakes. I'll do the left again. This data acquisition feature extraction, this is all implemented in Unity. It's very easy to use, so you can just place these controls into the computer game. You can, of course, also attach the controls to the moving item. This gives, for example, a more natural control. And here's another example of a Unity game that we did with the Unicorn Hybrid Black. Um, so in this case, I'm using the keyboard to move around and the spacebar to jump. And then I can look at these boxes. And with the brain computer interface, I'm able to destroy the boxes. So it's exploding. And this allows me to collect one of the coins. And when I get the coin, then the brown bridge here is closing. And I can actually continue in the game. So I can move over it. And now I have to avoid the blue enemy. And I look at the next box. Again, I can only destroy it with the brain computer interface, not with the keyboard. So I need the BCI control to finish the game. And then suddenly the BCI system becomes very useful. So it would be useless with the BCI system to try to replace the keyboard or a joystick because they have a very high information transfer rate. But I can put something into the game that I can only master with the brain computer interface. So you could also put hidden doors into the game that you can only open, for example, with the BCI. And very nice is that we don't have false positives. So only the item that they want to destroy is actually destroyed. Here's another boom. So I can connect the next coin. So the next bridge behind me is closing. And this allows me to complete the game. And so on. And this principle is also that we can use to control human avatars. Um, we worked in a European Union project called Verevis Abdel Kader from CNRS. And he has this human like robotic system with two cameras fixed in the head of the robot. So the video images are transferred to the computer screen, and the patient is actually sitting in front of the computer screen. And he can uh, make a selection with the brain computer interface. So in this case, he made the high level decision to take the Coke and then the robot performs the movement himself. This is like the human body. So if I want to get the pen in front of me, I'm not imagining forward, forward, down, down. I just make the high level decision to get it and my body does it for me because I learned it many years ago. The same for the robot, whatever you Reprogram into the robot can be recalled with the brain computer interface. The robot also has context awareness because of the stereo vision and radar sensors. Now we are in continuous control mode, so you can explore the environment, um, you can look around. You can also see Pierre, one of the PhD students behind the robot for safety reasons. We don't want to risk that it's falling down. We have also the power supply cable. And then the robot stops in front of the table because of the context awareness. It goes to the initial position. And at the same time, the menu of the brain computer interface is changing. And now he can select, for example, what he wants to do with the cook, place it on the table, feed himself. That's also a program to stretch yourself and so on. And with this video, I actually would like to end my presentation. And please let me know if there are any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Christoph. I think I, I saw a few questions in the chat um, already. Uh, the first one came from Hannes Gamper. Uh, Hannes asks, are simultaneous measurements of EEG and e ECOG possible? I wonder if it could help develop a noise attenuation or point spread model for the electrical path from the brain surface through the skull or skin. Uh, so maybe it's it, possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, I just it's say of it, course possible. 
<laughs> it's possible, just complicated, because for ECOG implantation, you have to remove the scalp first, so all the bones and the dura mater are removed. Then you can put the grids onto the cortex, and afterwards the scalp, you know, is inserted again. And this stays like that for about two weeks. So it's a little bit complicated to place on top of the grid the EG electrodes. And besides that, you get also the shielding effect because these eco grids are made of silicon. So it's a big isolator, normally of eight by eight centimeters, overlaying the cortex. So the EG electrodes are above, above applied. But what you can do is uh, to use an ECOG electrode with holes in the middle. This is placed on the cortex, and then you are also getting some EG data on the surface. If you are looking just at different hemispheres, then it's very easy. So one hemisphere could have the ECOG grid and the other hemisphere the EG data. Then you could easily do it. A little bit easier is to use stereo EG. So these are the depth electrodes. So in this case, people are just making a little borehole. Then they insert the stereo EEG electrode. This is just a few millimeters, and around that you can easily have EEG electrodes. Um, uh, is there any ut utility for um, a simultaneous ECOG EEG measurement um, for figuring out how to denoise an EEG sig signal or reconstruct the ECOG signal from the EEG? Of course, there are different software solutions for doing that. Of course, the ECOG is much bigger than the EEG, and the signal goes to a much higher frequency. Uh, so Nuri Fierat Inche showed that it even goes to one kilohertz. Um, then the signal is really tiny, and you wouldn't see it anymore on the on the surface because it's so small. But the lower components, alpha, beta, lower gamma, is what you can also see in the EEG. And then it becomes very interesting, of course, to, to compare both. Um, how long do people use the ECOG interface uh, at a time? Uh, uh, normally, people are implanted for one or two weeks, and then the ECOG grids are removed again. Okay. Uh, we have one question from Ida. Hi, Ida, thank are you, you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a computational neuroscientist, and we also build interaction-based algorithms in Microsoft Research in New York City, uh, in the Reinforcement Learning Division. Uh, one thing that we have been um, sort of working with is the idea that in coma patients or in some other sort of situations where you can't calibrate the signal based on the person's response because there is no ground truth. Um, we've been building some algorithms called interaction grounded learning that can sort of work with that. I wonder whether um, you have some uh, maybe uh, real cases of um, having to ground a signal for a patient that you cannot get a response from and how you would deal with this problem. So first of all, for these patients, it's important to calibrate as quick as possible. So we developed this P300 paradigm with the white protactile stimulators, and then we need only 2.5 minutes to calibrate the BCI system. So this is much faster than anything else used at the moment, which is stimulation, uh, white protactile stimulation based or auditory stimulation based. And this is crucial because these patients very often have only awareness for a few minutes and you have to catch the window when you are calibrating. So we are doing everything beforehand to wake them up. So we shake them, we speak with them, and then we, we record quickly the 2.5 minutes. That's also the reason why the EEG system must be ultra stable. It would be a disaster if you are getting too many artifacts in these 2.5 minutes. And then we can already move to yes and no communication. So. And that's very objective because it's a real-time decision. Then you can ask, do you like Microsoft? They respond with yes. And you are just counting the correct answers. So there's no cross-validation, no statistics. It's just the objective answer. And it tells you really if the person has awareness. Thank you so much. Um, situations where the patient is minimally conscious, um, you don't have that couple of minutes to figure out what's the window in which they might be responding. Is there any 
um, situations where there's still attempts to figure out if there is a response coming out of the person over longer stretches of time without any grounding? I'm not sure. So with Mind Beagle, we have a so-called quick test. It takes 30 seconds and you can just probe a couple of times during the day when there is awareness because it's so quick, only 30 seconds. And when you detect the awareness, then you can uh, calibrate the brain computer interface based on that. But if you found one slot where the calibration signal worked, then you can use it forever, basically, and repeat the quick test uh, every day in the morning and or in the afternoon. And if there's awareness, then you can have, for example, a conversation. Or you can also apply a rehabilitation protocol. So we uh, developed also some rehab protocols for these patients where we could nicely show the improving coma recovery scale revised when we are doing that, and then it makes, of course, sense to apply the rehab procedure when they have awareness, because then it's more effective. Thank you so much. If there's any references to how this procedure is done, uh, I'd appreciate it if you could drop it in the chat. Thank you so much. I, I sent you some links. It's on Pontius, uh, so open source. You can just uh, download it. Thank you. Um, Christoph, are, are there particular uh, machine learning or deep learning approaches that you see uh, that seem to work uh, most effectively, um, or, or does it uh, kind of vary with the application? So for brain computer interface control, we are still using mostly linear discriminant analysis and support vector machines because they are generally enough to work with this non-stationary EEG signal. So all the other approaches approaches that we, we tested and have seen in the literature, neural networks in Markov models, they mostly overfit. So they give maybe better results on calibration and cross-validation data, but real-time behavior is um, always better with LDA and support vector machines. This, this is what we suggest. For, for deep learning, for biomarkers, for example, on large data sets, it's different, of course. So we have recorded, for example, 30,000 data sets with stroke patients and their deep learning algorithms make sense to extract biomarkers. So in stroke patients, we can, for example, predict with the resting state EEG recording of 10 minutes, how much they are improving if they use recoveries. Great. Yoda Wong has arrived. Uh, Yoda is the actual host, but he's been busy with data collection, uh, but he's been listening uh, intently. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, you Yoda, you're, you're, uh, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, for some reason, probably your audio device. Um, How about now? Yes. Yeah, um, so I posted a question on the chat, so, but I can uh, refresh here. Uh, so the artifact rejection in Black Flip video and Oscar is amazing. Uh, I wonder how, how long does it take to change this denoising algorithms? And second, uh, how do we know whether the algorithm is you know, overcorrect the signal given we don't have a ground truth of EEG? Um, of course, that's crucial, so we need uh, about two seconds of clean EEG data to make OSCAR work, uh, first of all, and then it's cleaning very effectively, so it's adaptive. And we tested it with different uh, BCI principles, motor imagery P300 and 200 SSVPs, and we just had a look how much of the source signal we are destroying, and it's almost nothing. So we tuned the, the algorithms in a way to kill most of the artifacts, but to leave the source signal untouched. And if you're looking at the evoked potentials, then we are talking of the promil range of what we are killing. So it doesn't matter at all. Um, OSCAR is also very important, for example, for a coma patient. So I give this example again, because the window when you are able to do the recording is so short. Um, so if you only get 2.5 minutes, then of course you, you have to have all the data available. You don't want to have artifacts inside. And sometimes, you know, uh, one electrode could be maybe noisy and we, with Oscar, you get it clean again. Got it. Thank you. 
Um, any questions from the people in the room? Okay. Um, any more questions for the online participants? I did have I did have one question, uh, which is maybe a bit abstract, but but are you aware of any? And it relates back to my previous question about uh, this this path from the brain surface to the the surface of the skull. Are you aware of any any models that that would kind of try and quantify? Um, so I'm I'm thinking we have a certain understanding of what what should happen in terms of electrical activity on the surface of the brain. Are there any models that would quantify uh, what we should actually expect to measure in terms of EEG? Like just just a uh, some some um, yeah some whether that path, for example, is even linear or or uh, if we should expect some time variance in there or or if if there's any any computational description of this. There, there are a lot of models available, and actually my partner, Cheetah Günther Edlinger, made his PhD about this topic. I can send you some publications so that you can have a look. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that would and be in, do, do you know the Jeff Ogerman group in Seattle? Uh, it's a new surgeon who worked with Kai Miller or in, in, and they did EG and ECOG co-registrations, actually. Oh, okay. Very nice. So good. I can also add you the, the link to, to the group and then you can also follow up with these guys. Yes, yes, please. That sounds that sounds interesting. Thank you. And did you see by the way our new Bangolin system? Otherwise I show you quickly uh, a slide. Just one slide. Um, so the, we developed a high resolution grid. Looks like that. So it has 16 golden pins. They are eight millimeters spaced. And with this system, we can actually mount 1024 channels on the human skull. Um, so in this image, you can see how it looks for 1024 channels. This is the result for a single finger movement task. So the person was moving index finger, little finger, and so on. And we color coded, you can see here in green, for example, the index finger. This is the little finger and so on. So all five fingers are very nicely represented in EEG. And on the left-hand side, the small circles are the pangolin channels. We have 1,024 of these. And the dark gray are the standard clinical 1020 electrodes. You can see the diameter is much bigger. So we have nine pangolin electrodes on the area of one single clinical EEG electrode. You can also imagine if only one EEG electrode in the clinic is here, you're blind for single finger movements, but with the Bangolin system, we find it. This would actually be the perfect comparison between ECOG and EEG, because here we have the spatial resolution that you need, uh, and which is also comparable to ECOG recordings. And uh, so, so then a quick follow-up: Are you aware of of this Bangolin being used for for developing these models? You mentioned the, the group in uh, Seattle, have at, they have they used? No, not at the moment because the Bangolin is very new. So this publication about the single finger movements with EEG was just coming out. And be, before it was almost impossible to extract this spatial resolution with EEG. And there, there's a lot of research now starting with the Bangolin. They want to decode, for example, audio information voices from the auditory cortex with EEG. And of course, for the comparison with ECOG or Stereo EG, it makes a lot of sense too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Aida, I see you have another question. Yeah, quick follow up to an earlier question. Uh, do you think the reason that uh, deep, our deep agents, neural networks don't do as well as SVMs and simpler classification approaches is because you have little uh, data during calibration, and if there is a longer periods of data, for instance, in control subjects, do they perform better? No, the, the problem is the overfitting. So they learn the training data too much in detail, and the, the other classifiers are more general. Uh, so longer data, in my experience, doesn't help. What you need is short precise and accurate data, as short as possible, but as good as possible, 
and then you get the perfect calibration signal. Um, so at the beginning of PCI research many years ago, people made actually the mistake to record hours of EEG data, and then they wanted to train the brain compute interface on all these hours of data. With neural net networks, it, it just failed because it's changing uh, too much and overfitting completely. And then we are now using only 20 seconds to, to calibrate the brain compute interface, then we get perfect control. But the, the signal must be perfect, so we are doing everything to get the perfect 20 seconds. EEG equipment must be perfect, the, the experiment must be perfect, the stimulus, the timing, just everything, and then you can minimize the training time tremendously. Thank you, that's very helpful, because one of the reasons neural networks overfit is usually that they need a lot of data, but in this case, it seems like it's a, it's a kind of a problem that they're not best suited for. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, any final questions? Uh, going once, going twice, three times. Okay, let's give one more round of applause for Christoph. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, I just posted. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, Vic, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> my, my apologies, I was slow on the mute. Is it still okay to ask a question? Uh, yes, fine with me. Yeah, and I'm just following up on the neural network question, which is uh, if you sort of have a, if you're able to identify a pool of, uh, uh, you know, individuals that may essentially have some sort of a, a high risk for stroke uh, in the future, uh, is it, does it make sense to collect some baseline data or some training data that can be used in the event that a stroke does happen? So this is like more of an insurance uh, policy kind of thing where you could collect and store that data. Does it make sense to have that uh, calibration training data? And if so, what kind of data would you end up collecting? Uh, for, for stroke, I find it a little bit difficult because it's a sudden event because one of the arteries gets blocked or you get some bleeding and too much pressure. So it's a sudden event caused by something else. So not really the brain is responsible for that. Um, but if you look at Alzheimer or Parkinson, this is something where becomes very interesting because there are a lot of biomarkers in the EEG for both that you can extract and the neural networks and deep learning algorithms become very useful because you can create, uh, you know, huge databases with thousands of examples and then you can just compare the features uh, to each other. Then, of course, it becomes useful. This is fascinating what you're doing. Thank it's you. Nice Thank you for that, yeah. us. Okay, one final check for uh, last questions. All right, uh, thanks very much, Christoph. Um, oh, thank you. Do we much have one? For hosting. Have a nice day. Okay, thanks. Bye.